you could uh, bring us back from the interview and then just go right into your your segment. I can't remember what was your awesome cool name for it. Oh, damn, no, I don't remember either. Oh no, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. I mean, I'm sitting in front of a computer. I could just write this crap down, <laughs> <laughs> but that's asking too much, I guess. Happy Holidays 2020, everybody, and welcome to Episode 10 of the Plastic Posse Podcast, sponsored by Goodman Models. Today, we've got a gift-sized holiday episode for you with not one, but two interview segments, so hopefully you'll enjoy uh, the larger episode. And we also want to shout out a couple of other things you should be checking out if you're not already. First of all, a Scale Canadian TV vlog over on YouTube with our friend Jim Bates. That's great stuff. And also check out the new blog by Stephen Lee called Sprue Pie with Frets. We're really enjoying that. Anyway, let's get on with the episode. Doug, TJ, how are you guys doing? It's almost Christmas. Good, good. I am great. Happy holidays to all you listeners out there. It's hard to believe, but the year that was 2020 is almost behind it. And I, for one, am a a grateful guy. (laughs) 2020 is the devil. (laughs) We have a great show planned for you guys. We have uh, not one interview, but two interviews. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But before we get going, the three of us wanted to wish a get well soon to our good friend Joe Porsche from IPMS Las Vegas. Uh, Joe is recovering from some health issues. And Joe, uh, we just want you to know we're thinking about you. and We hope you get better soon. Get strong, buddy. Take care, man. Yes. Hang in there, man. You got it. What's new with you guys, TJ? What have you been up to the last couple of weeks? Uh, I mean, not not a whole lot, really. Well, that's not true, I guess. No, I have been, uh, you know, painting a lot of Warhammer stuff, which is like the same thing I say every episode, but it's usually true. Hey, man, own that. It's you, man. Yeah. Own it. So let me uh, let me pull up here. I should have had it ready because I have my list of things that I've painted this year. I have painted 59 models so far this year, not including the the real models that I've done too. Like my tank, I've done a handful of tanks. Doug, you can't see me, but I'm standing up right now saluting TJ uh, for completing that many projects in a year. That is nothing. My uh, best friend David is closing in on a thousand miniatures this year. I don't know if he's going to make it. Last time we talked about it was... I think it was like a week and a half ago he was at over 900 painted Jeez. finished wow. miniatures he is a machine i am not a machine for me 59 is a lot which i'm happy about because i'm going to add more to it because i've got a couple of things on my desk now i've got the week of Chris after christmas off so i've got like 11 12 i can't remember i think 11 or 12 days uh, off so i got nothing planned And uh, I will be cranking out as many Space Marines as I can between then. I'd like to get to 75. That would be a huge confidence boost because I didn't think I could get what I got done this year. So That's terrific. I mean, you're not going to be still in your buddy David's uh, figure painting trophy anytime soon, but 75 certainly nothing to be ashamed of. So I filled out a, a sheet, the one that I pulled up. It's like my hobby log. Uh, I started it in January of this year and um, it's, you know, it's a bunch of spaces so you can say what, you know, what you painted and keeps a running total and you add the date and everything. And then he has a goal. So my goal was to finish my Raptors space Marine army. And I think, I mean, technically I've completed that goal. I have a fully painted army that I play with every week with my friend, Andrew. So, I mean, I essentially met my goal, but if anyone knows anything about, miniature war game your army is never really done you can always add more to it change stuff out you know so on and so forth so i still have lots of unpainted things to add to it but i have a completed 100 percent painted space marine army and it's pretty awesome i've never had that before so i was pretty pleased with myself 
Nice. Well, hey, I want to go back before we move on. I want to go back and talk about you mentioned that you opened like a spreadsheet and it's a little too early to be talking New Year's resolutions. Maybe we'll hit that in the next episode. But I've been thinking a lot about not finishing as many projects as I'd like to and thinking about maybe in the initial stages of projects, you know, creating like a project plan. And each time you go down to the bench, maybe having actually a little section where you just write down in your sheet, okay, next time I go down to the bench, I'm going to do A, B, you know, I'm going to paint the cockpit or I'm going to put the turret together on my tank, you know, whatever it is. But I really like that idea, TJ. Yes, uh, I agree with you. So, uh, you know, obviously this is a little different than that, but I'm a, it's funny, I'm a big proponent of planning, but I'm terrible at it. (laughs) It's my weakest aspect in my life by far. It's the thing I'm least good at with my job, which is probably, and it's probably the most important part of my job and I'm terrible at it. Uh, Somehow I've fumbled my way through 20 years in, in my trade and convinced everyone I work for to give me more money. So I'm clearly doing something right, but I always feel like I can never plan well. I make a lot of internal plans and I think your idea of actually writing out a plan to finish a model is actually a really good idea. I mean, I know this list that I made uh, for this year, just with stuff that I finished has helped me because it's, you know, because a lot of times with, with my Warhammer stuff, I paint it, I take a picture of it and it goes into my storage case. You know, I have like a, a foam storage, like transport case for it. So all my bottles yeah. in there and you know, they don't really go on display and if they did, my display cabinet's not in the basement. It's upstairs in my bedroom, which my wife absolutely loves. She's so happy that it's there. <laughs> Doug, what do you think about project planning? Um, it sounds like a great idea, but I know how good I am at actually following up on even planning something. <laughs> so, I don't know that it's going to happen for me. It's just one of those things that's like easy to talk a big game about and then really hard to follow through on. Finishing a kit, finishing a project, especially an involved one with lots of weathering and maybe a base or a diorama, has so many elements that I think a project plan might really help me finish more than three or four projects a year. Yeah. I mean, how many things did you finish this year? Do you know? Um, If I get this little tank uh, done, I think maybe four. I mean, that's aside from all my Warhammer stuff. Which I think, as I've I've brought up before, is finished to a lesser degree than my display, like one thirty fifth scale tanks. I also did I did three tanks this year. That was it. I finished six Star Wars models, and I and I got some good progress done on a on the EZ eight Sherman, but I didn't ever finish that one. You got time. I don't have space. I sent you <laughs> yeah, that that's true. model desk. It's covered with all kinds of construction stuff. That's how my project is right now. Yeah, speaking of that, Doug, uh, tell us what you've been up to. Well, I started hanging drywall this week. I've got my line sets pulled for a uh, heat pump so I can get some heat into my into my model room and my reptile room and uh, my wife's sewing room. Drywall is going in. Hopefully soon I'll be mudding and taping and getting ready to finish that bad boy and actually get some some space for me to work in. All right, Scott. So that's what we're doing. What are you doing right now? Well, you know, not a whole lot, unfortunately, had some uh, kind of personal stuff to deal with, but I have been working on my little uh, Sherman and uh, the next stage for me is I've decided I can't live with the decal. So I'm going to cut some stencils and then uh, airbrush the markings and then a little bit of weathering and it'll be done. Other than that, just have to wait till next time. Haven't been that productive, but soon, hopefully. Cool. Doug, did we get some listener feedback this time? We sure did. I want to go back to one that I missed on our last episode. Uh, Hendrick J.S., I assume, or J's, Hendrick J's. Hey, guys, just stopping by to say what an amazing podcast you're producing. Amazing content and interviews. The podcast is my best companion in my long drives. Greetings from Darmstadt, Germany. I hope when things get back to normal to see you guys in, at, in one of the amazing European events. What do you think, guys? We go to Europe? Uh, yeah. Give me an excuse. I would love to. By the way, I think Hendrix is our official first member of the posse in Germany. Awesome. Well, welcome, Hendrix. Love to have you. 
We got David Brian Bridges said, fun podcast to listen to while I'm at the workbench. Very engaging and enjoyable. Mike Norris, in Podcast 9, you were wondering if a 132nd scale Hellcat would be released. He says, Hellcat released their 124th Hellcat some time ago. I, I am very aware of that 124 scale Hellcat. I'm just not aware of the, of the space issue uh, that I have going right now. I would love to have one of those because the Hellcat is my absolute favorite airplane. It's just a little big for me as well. But yeah, that's an awesome aircraft. I think I think I'll have one sometime. Just have to work on that model room and get the space. We got James Skiffins of the uh, Just Making Conversation podcast. He says, yeah, yeah, they're on episode three, I think, coming that just came out. Yep. Talking about paints. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the ad to the group and a big thank you for giving Malcolm and I a shout out in your latest podcast. Great to be a part of the family of podcasters. I'm a modeler of many years with a passion for dioramas and just as a way of saying hi, thought I would share some of my some of my latest work. And that is on our page. That is actually on the Plastic Posse Facebook page. Take a look. It's really good stuff. That was great feedback, James. Appreciate that. And uh, we're going to be talking to your buddy Malcolm Childs here in just a few minutes in our first interview segment. All right. We have Andy Callis. Congrats on another great podcast. During Matt McDougall's interview, he mentioned ordering the Marshall Speeder from The Mandalorian. I'm having trouble finding a kit. Any ideas on who might produce the kit and where one could be ordered? It was suggested to him by by Dugues himself to uh, check out Merlin Models. That's where apparently you can find that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that 112 scale Speeder. That's going to be awesome. Very cool. And the last one we have, Rick Baker. Another solid episode. I really look forward to your podcast. As I mentioned before, I listen to all the peer podcasts, but yours is the one that most closely hews to my interests. I'm grateful to have connection. Thank you, you guys. And by extension, you or other listeners are my de facto modeling club. <laughs> and here, this is a little embarrassing for me. I especially enjoy Doug's di- digression. Doug's digression. That's my, my, my sec- segment, I guess. I like that. <laughs> your childhood love of Imperial speeder bikes. Who could resist making the whooshing sound sound effects as you took a corner on your bike? Not mere mortals, that's for sure. Anyway, I think Doug should second that speeder bike, should get a second speeder bike kit and create a diorama of the two scout troopers from the beginning of the Mandalorian chapter eight, as they take in a round of target practice and engage in some light war crimes. Actually, I think I would model them punching the child. That's for having such a stupid name. You know, <laughs> that, that would be me, but <laughs> TJ, I think Doug has fans. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and I don't really hate the name. It's just kind of weird. It's fine. <laughs> it was like, that's a strange name. Okay, it's Star Wars. I'll move on. His name's Baby Yoda. I don't His care what anyone says. Baby Yoda, and that's perfect. Anyway, he, he says, if you're, ever, uh, if you're ever stuck for Star Wars diorama ideas, I always have ambitions that, and difficult to achieve plans running through my brains that I'm happy to foist on others to complete. Just ask him. Awesome feedback, Rick. Great member of the posse. He He's given us feedback several times, and it's always fun to hear what he has to say. Yeah, that's really fun. Look forward to seeing more of his dioramas, that's for sure. Okay, well, thanks, Doug. Awesome feedback, as always. We appreciate everybody writing in to us. You can write in to us at our Facebook page, the Plastic Posse Podcast, or you can email us, if that's more your speed, at plasticpossepodcast at gmail.com. So keep the ideas coming, feedback, positive or negative. We like the positive better, but we'll take all kinds. <laughs> so really appreciate that. Uh, getting back to uh, what uh, James was talking about earlier, we have his partner in crime from Just Making Conversation here in an interview, Malcolm Childs. It was a lot of fun talking to Malcolm, uh, both about his charity, which is Models for Heroes. I've mentioned that a couple episodes in a row now. Uh, But we get into that quite a bit and what a great organization that is and and what they do for veterans in the UK uh, with scale modeling. And then also uh, mention the uh, podcast that we're talking about, Just Making Conversation. So here's the interview and uh, hope you enjoy it. Well, 
Well, welcome to another interview segment of our show. Today, I am delighted to be joined from the UK by Malcolm Childs with the Models for Heroes charity. Malcolm, welcome to the show. Thank you, Scott. It's good to be here. Thank you for uh, letting me take over your airwaves for a short period of time. It's our pleasure. It's great to talk to you. I'm really excited for our listeners to hear about your efforts and and what you do, because it's just a tremendous cause. So Malcolm, uh, before we get started talking about that, tell us a little bit about yourself. So yeah, I'm Malcolm Childs. I'm in the early part of my 40s. I have a lovely wife and family, and I am a model maker for all my sins. Model making since I was able to lift plastic. I think my dad was a a railway modeler. Uh, he was the type of railway modeler that had, never had a layout, but we would go to all of the railway model shows. He would have all the magazines. He would uh, have friends that would come around and they would talk about railways, but he never actually made anything himself, I don't think, that I can remember. But we always had tools and things like that around the house, and, and model making was kind of part of my interest. So he would always be happy to buy me model aircraft and things like that. And that's how my hobby started, really as building model aircraft, remembering all the days that we went to air shows and things like that, and we would remake the the aircraft that we saw at the show. And that's how I built my hobby up, um, up until probably I was about 20, and then other things got in the way, as I, I'm sure the story is very similar to most <laughs> people's. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Fast cars and women got in the way, <laughs> I'd love to think. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> One of those is not true. <laughs> But yes, uh, once I was a bit older, I think I've, I ended up getting back into the hobby through a, um, a YouTube rabbit hole, if you know what I mean. So you start looking up one thing, and then you end up learning about something completely different. I can't remember what it was I was researching. I say researching, probably just you know, just hanging out. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was intensely researching something. I ended up watching a video by a chap called Scale Model Medic. And he was putting the weathering and finishing touches onto a Millennium Falcon. Oh, okay. And the way that the wash ran between all the little greeblies and just kind of made its way through all the channels automatically, I thought was fascinating. Quite mesmerizing. I don't know if you, you can agree with me on that when you have a wash running through a panel line. Scale Model Medic is a great YouTube channel, so definitely uh, agree with you there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. It's just uh, nice to watch this paint moving its way around. I immediately thought, I need one of those. I need one of those Millennium <laughs> Falcons in my house. I need it on my shelf. How can I get one of those Millennium Falcons on my shelf? So uh, I looked into buying the kit, and I looked into uh, what tools I would need to uh, rebuy, what skills I would need to re- relearn, and I started uh, researching like chipping and, and, and other things, and I Ended up uh, joining a local model club and starting getting back into the hobby again. It was just a couple of years later after that, I actually built the Million Falcon. But in the time that I was back into the hobby, I yeah joined my local model club, went to lots of model shows. And that's when I noticed that a lot of my friends that I was making at these model shows were veterans or they were currently serving. And that was something quite interesting to me because in my youth, when a lot of my friends were uh, in service families, because my dad was in the RAF. And so it was kind of a recognizable friendship group. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think mm. that makes sense. Yeah. So, and it got me thinking and, and sort of chatting about wondering why, you know, so many people were in the hobby that were service personnel. And I just put it down to the fact that they were making tanks and making aircraft and making military vehicles. And that was the interest that brought them into the hobby. I didn't pay any more attention to that. And then um, I was on Reddit, probably on another rabbit hole (laughs) journey. (laughs) (laughs) And there was a post by a chap called John Emery, and he was asking for donations of model kits for his charity called Models for Troops. And he is based in the USA. Uh, He just had a simple uh, request up on his Reddit page saying, need some model kits to be sending out to Afghanistan and it's for the chaps who are between missions gives them something to do takes their mind off the day 
and it's it's a wonderful way of, of getting some happiness sort of back if you like right and yeah. i thought that was such a fantastic idea i immediately wrote john an email and i said that's fantastic how can i help do you know if there's anything like that in the uk be careful what you ask for <laughs> <laughs> yes that's right <laughs> absolutely so he wrote back saying no there wasn't anything that he knew of in the uk and he would you know quite uh, happily talk about his charity and help me if I felt fancy starting mine up. I don't know what came over me. And at that moment, I thought, yeah, that would be a good idea. You know, I've got nothing else to do. <laughs> Why don't I invest all my time in setting up a, a charity that's going to that's gonna do this? So I originally, now obviously we're talking about Models for Heroes now, but originally when it started, it was a local recovery center for injured veterans. There's a charity called Help for Heroes. It's a large charity in England, and they support guys who have had limbs blown off. Um, they support guys who have had injuries while in combat. And uh, this recovery is local to me. And I, I wrote them an email and said, do you do any activities that could be therapeutic around model making? And they did. So I said, oh, I'd love to help. And fortunately, the person I spoke to was actually into model making as well. So I went down there for the day. And just to kind of roll one of their model making uh, groups along, really. So I got there, and their cupboard for their models, I would say 90% of the models in their cupboard had been started already. Okay. I would say in their ice cream tub of tools and paints, uh, half was for enamels, half was for acrylics. Um, The brushes they had were large. Barely hairy brushes. <laughs> <laughs> they had no way of taking the plastic off the sprues. They had no way of sanding. They had obviously they had absolutely no weathering products whatsoever. They had the absolute very bare minimum um, of model making. And okay. being a model maker myself, I found that unacceptable. <laughs> okay, and I, I, luckily I was in a position that I could say, "Hey, look, next time I come down, I'll bring you some proper clippers. I'll bring you." a couple of sanding sticks. I'll bring you uh, some proper glues and a little small selection of acrylic paints, and we'll go from there. And I'll also bring you some, you know, basic airfix kits down, 172nd scale, and we'll go from there. And that's kind of how it started. I ended up not having much stuff in my own stash left because I was giving it away, so I started asking people if they could help, and then it grew from there. Other recovery centers wanted to have model making as well, the chaps were reporting that they felt rested after a model making session, that they felt that they achieved something that someone with uh, depression and uh, severe anxiety could start a model kit from the very beginning, from step one. And once you finish that step, you can sort of take a breath and then move to the second step. It's not like you've got a massive black canvas to fulfill or a thousand piece jigsaw in front of you and you don't know where to start. With model making, you've got all set parts. It's all numerical. It's all categorized. You can lay it all out and and go from start to finish. And that was beneficial, they found, in terms of uh, recovery, you know, um, and behavioral intervention. And also, of course, there's the fact that once you're in that zone of model building, you're not thinking about how you're going to pay your rent next month. You're not thinking about what happened to you three years ago in Afghanistan, you're thinking about how the hell you're going to get part two onto part four and who's going to hold the other bit so that you can get the glue in. (laughs) Absolutely. And that is where we want people to be, is in the present moment, is in the room, you know, with the other guys also building, also dropping things on the floor, also getting frustrated and having having a big old laugh, you know, and that is the kind of crux of a modeling session with Models for Heroes. And it's very curative and uh, very meaningful. And that's basically how Models for Heroes kind of started and is carrying on. What a tremendous story. You know, as a fellow modeler, I can relate to that so much as far as the modeling goes and the therapeutic benefits of, you know, sitting down on the bench and working with your hands while your job problems and your life problems and COVID-19 problems all kind of melt away as you 
concentrate on getting that aircraft seat in the right position and whatever. Also want to just commend you. You know, you you had model building um, at an early age. Your father was supportive of your hobby and uh, you've been able to channel that love and very, very unselfishly help other people and take a passion that you share and really benefit other people with that. That is just the world needs a lot more of that, especially right now in 2020. Thank you. Well, the way I see it is that um, chaps who have sacrificed their health and even worse, sacrificed their lives and you know their relationship with their families to protect mine deserve a little bit of help. And if if it's model making that is what I am good at and telling people to go and do model making is what I'm good at, then great. Then that's the thing that I'll use to help those people who have helped me. That's That's how I see it. Well said. Thanks. As you got started, and it, and it sounds like uh, pretty immediately that you could see some real benefits for the people that were using the kits and the tools that you had provided. How did things evolve and change for Models for Heroes? Okay, so once word had got out within Help for Heroes that there was a, this activity that could be supported through Models for Heroes, a lot of the recovery centers were starting their own activities and things like that and and model making become became quite uh, popular within those centers the one over to the uh, east of london colchester model making became their uh, voted favorite activity in their entire uh, center that's great uh, over the top of kayaking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the one down in Plymouth in the south of England, they um, found that the, the group was gelling together. People were coming to the modeling session, not just to do some modeling, but just to hang out and have a chat. And that was fine. You know, it didn't, you didn't have to sit down and do some, you know, bend plastic. You, you just enjoy the atmosphere and just enjoy the banter. And they found that people were getting up coming out of their houses, making the trip to the center just to go and talk to the model makers and, and chat about vehicles and chat about old times over, you know, not interested in the model making so much. So that was a useful tool for getting people uh, sort of out of their houses. And when you've, you know, you're know you trying to treat someone with depression, getting them to get out and do something is, is, uh, is a step. I don't want to take the focus away from what we're talking about. That social element of modeling that we're all kind of missing so much in 2020, um, as you were describing um, initially what was happening, seems like it's it's really important, or maybe in some ways as important as the actual modeling itself, but you know, providing an activity that people can build some common ground on and allowing them to interact with each other. Mm, well, absolutely. It was, it was quite clear within you know, six months of Models for Heroes that it wasn't actually about the models at all. And it was about the people coming together to chat about their the vehicles that they love, you know, or their enthusiasm for a particular tank or something. And and it was that connection that that, that drew people to the modeling, and that was what was uh, what is possibly the most popular thing about these these sessions. I know that uh, there are some veteran hubs, uh, which is an area where veteran charities are invited to come to and veterans will go there um, to have cups of tea and have a chat but also they can have an opportunity to go and talk to the Royal British Legion or they can go and talk to their uh, veterans support rather than them having to go to all these different places themselves what they found was if they had a modeling session there the guys would come over to the modeling session sit there all day and then have their interviews every now and again with all of the different charities that was just before <laughs> COVID uh, hit was uh, kind of part of the pilot scheme that we had up in uh, West Berkshire with the NHS is they wanted to have the modeling session in the center and then have these other uh, groups come along. And initially we found it, you know, people were, were coming to the group, of course, then we were made to stay indoors. So that uh, will have to be put on a back burner. As things have evolved, uh, who are some other groups or people? Obviously, there are volunteers, but you know who supports uh, Models for Heroes and helps make uh, this tremendous foundation uh, successful. Besides yourself, it's all the other model makers in the glo- on the globe. I would say the community around model making. Once you once you explain that that what we try and do is get people together to make models and just to relax, I think other model makers then understand exactly what it is we're trying to promote. And what we what it is we're trying to 
uh, show people how restful it is. Now, we are very lucky in that we have you know, a generous community that will donate unstarted models to us to use in the modeling sessions or a set of paints or some brushes. And that is how we run Models for Heroes. It's entirely done through donations. Lately, we're very lucky in that we've had some grants to be able to do some training. But initially, it was all donations, all time donated as well. So at the moment, we have 145 volunteers across the UK, and they donate their time, uh, their expertise, and their passion for the hobby to grow the hobby and to help these beneficiaries as best they can. We also had to, because as we grew, we had to have some sort of governance for Models for Heroes. So we have nine directors. We became a community interest company this year so that we are transparent and open, you know, in terms of uh, finances and things like that. And it's something that needs to be done as you grow uh, as a group. So yeah, so we're proper, proper and uh, signed off uh, organization now, which is very nice. Crossing those T's and dotting those I's, of course. Oh, it's got to be done. It's the saddest thing is all that all that extra paperwork me- means I can't go out and give some guys some kits as simple as I want to do. But, you know, these, these things have to be done, don't they? Well, let's, uh, let's get to where the rubber meets the road here, Malcolm. How can our listeners uh, of this podcast, how can we help? Okay, so the first step, I would say, would go to our website, which is modelsforheroes.org.uk. And on there are all the details that you would need to find out about model making and how it helps. There's a research page on there, for instance. So it talks about the guidelines for what the UK um, doctors run by. It's called the NICE guidelines. And in there, it's a section about how creative activity can help with recovery from certain mental health difficulties. Uh, We have uh, lists of the events that we have when we are running them. We also have opportunities for people, if they're listening in the UK, can volunteer they can sign up and join our team and also we have the address for where you can send unstarted model kits to and that is uh, models for heroes hq uh, in the uk and anything would be greatly received as long as it's an unstarted kit as i've said before that we would be most happy to uh, uh, take it so also we have uh, an amazon wish list as well if you wanted to look on there You can uh, pick the glues that we prefer, choose the tweezers that we prefer to use, that kind of thing. A few cutting mats. And uh, every little tiny bit helps, honestly. Uh, I know we've got eight cutting mats currently in stock, so I need some more of them. (laughs) I'm saying that. We're going to get 100 cutting mats now, aren't we? (laughs) (laughs) I noticed there's also a big green button on your website in the upper right-hand corner. So maybe if uh, somebody like me who's in Utah in the United States It may not be realistic to ship you some paints or some kits from here, but we can click on that donate button and help you that way. Is that true? Absolutely, yes. A big green button will take you to the different ways that you can help. So it goes straight to the shop and support. So that is the uh, Amazon link. Uh, Also, if you're going to be selling something on eBay, we're a part of the eBay charity uh, scheme where you can set it so that a percentage of the profit that you make from your eBay sale go directly to us, which is lovely because lots of lots of uh, model makers use ebay also your airfix flying hours if you collect the little squared tokens on the side of airfix kits if you send them to us we can use those to get uh, free kits from airfix which is a lovely scheme because it means you know everyone benefits and everyone can help in their own little way also you can donate funds directly to us uh, either through our paypal link which is also on that donate button or if you wanted to set up a, a fundraiser perhaps there's our just giving link on there as well it's it's all there it's all there laid out for you to be able to help us and also if you just want to send us an email you can hit the contact button and um, type in some nice words to us as well all right that's modelsforheroes.org.uk correct Mm -hmm. absolutely well listeners you've got a great opportunity here Malcolm, I'm going to, after, as soon as we get done with this interview, I am going to send you a donation, challenge all of my listeners to do the same thing. Just a tremendous organization as model makers. Uh, I think we can all relate to that aspect of it, but also uh, recognizing the contributions of the veterans and what they've given you and uh, having a desire to help them back is just very commendable. Thanks, Scott.
before we were uh, talking about this interview, you had mentioned that you were kind of considering getting into uh, the realm of podcasting as well. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So me and a fellow volunteer, actually, we ended up talking about model making all the time online, and we felt that we could record this noise that we make and let people listen in. So we are making a podcast over here called Just Making Conversation. Uh, you can find us on uh, Facebook at the moment. Uh, you can also listen to us on uh, Spotify and Anchor.com. Our first episode goes out, let me think now, that'll be this Monday, which of course will be in the past when you're listening to this. But <laughs> if you go to uh, Just Making Conversation on Facebook, there will be a couple of episodes for you to listen to. We'd love your feedback. We'd love to get involved with, with what we're talking about, talking about the basic things like tools and paints for now. But as we grow and as we get a bit of a, a listener base, I'm sure our topics will be much more varied and much more in-depth. Okay, so that's Just Making Conversation on Facebook. Listeners, go check that out. Let's Give them some downloads and support that podcast. That sounds terrific. And modelsforheroes.org.uk. Anything uh, you can do for Malcolm and this terrific organization is much appreciated. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah. So um, one of the other things is you can do to help is just support us with social media likes. It sounds so, so cliche these days, but someone just getting on our side and waving that flag for us from wherever they are is so helpful. So share either this podcast or share uh, a link of modelsforheroes.org.uk with your friends and get the word out there because that's how we share the love. Excellent. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share your website on there as well and open invitation, Malcolm, for you to come back anytime and uh, we'll talk about whatever you'd like. Also, anything that we can share or any way that we can help your organization, you just say the word. Thank you, Scott. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Just appreciate your efforts and everything you're doing. And hopefully our listeners will uh, step up and uh, provide you with some support. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they absolutely will. Take care, Malcolm. Thanks, you, mate. Cheers. All right, welcome back. Hope you guys uh, enjoyed that interview with Malcolm Childs. And uh, just want to let everyone know to reiterate that we really support everything that he does. And to ask you guys to please go check out his website at modelsforheroes.org.uk. We'd really appreciate it. And now, I guess we'll go ahead and move into my little corner of the podcast, the Wargaming Workshop. Da, 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 da. There, is that good for you? <laughs> So I guess today, what, I, what I'll talk about, um, I recently picked up, and like recently as in yesterday, which would be December 15th, a Tyranid Battle Force. I think we talked about it in the last episode too, but now I actually have it in my possession, and I'm looking at it right now, and it's really awesome. It's got 31 gross alien lizard bug monsters that are just amazing. So I'm really looking forward to getting getting that started because I, I think I mentioned it earlier in the episode. I have off the week after Christmas and I plan on devoting a nice portion of that week to gluing together some models and hopefully maybe even getting some paint on it. I've got some other projects that I, I would like to finish, too, but like, uh, I don't know, I'm I'm like a like a hobby butterfly. and I just float to every like little project. I get so easily distracted. A gigantic, disgusting alien bug monster is a really good distraction. Yeah, so I'm still trying to figure out... You know, I have a paint scheme, and I'll probably run it through you guys, too. Probably through the you know our chat or whatever. See what you think. Um, I, have a, I have a paint scheme, but I, I don't know if I want to continue it. Because, shocker for me, I don't choose something that's relatively easy. I have to choose something kind of <laughs> difficult which then increases the time it takes to do it. Cause I also have really high standards for myself, as you well know, Scott. Yeah. Self up and, and I'm getting better at that with a, mainly my war gaming stuff. I, I finish my war gaming models to a different standard than I do a one thirty fifth scale tank or a star Wars model 
where I really have the time to sit and make it look the way that I really see it in my mind or if a picture if I have a reference picture. With my wargaming stuff, I care about how it looks, but at the same time, they're little tiny dudes that walk across a table. No one's really looking at it like you necessarily would um, a model. I mean, I don't enter a lot of competitions anymore, but you know, I take pictures of everything I do, and I take huge pictures, which I've been, you know, I learned a long time ago from Scale Models Critique Group. Thanks, Will. Take big pictures. That was like one of the first pieces of feedback he ever gave me in that in that group. I took a little, a small picture of a, a Media Mark A Whippet, and he's like, "Yeah, it looks nice, but you need to be have bigger pictures." And I've never forgotten that. So now I take gigantic pictures. What are some of the candidates that you're thinking of as far as? Color palettes for ABMs, alien bug monsters. Well, you know, like I've <laughs> I've mentioned more than once, like all my space marines are olive drab, so I need something that isn't that. Not that there's anything wrong with olive drab; it's clearly the best color ever invented by man, because it's awesome looking. I do. I am a little tired of painting everything I own olive drab. I've probably gone through five bottles of AK real color olive drab this year. See, like my current scheme right now is like a bone and a blue black color, which are, it's cool, but I can't, I feel like I can't get it done fast enough to a good enough level that I'm happy with based on what I've already done in the past and it took me forever to do. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's the best thing about, you know, alien bug monsters. You can paint them whatever color you want. You know, and there's a lot of, a lot of good inspiration in, in nature. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. Oh yeah. You know, especially since they're they're like a, a, an amalgamation of like every type of animal, right? They're not just bugs. They're, they're vaguely bug-ish, but there's like ones that look like snakes. There's ones that look like things that aren't even on this planet. But you know what I mean? They look like snakes. It sounds like yes. something I need. Yes, there are. There's a lot of things called uh, raveners. I have some. I'll send you a picture of one. It, it's It's got a big, long snake tail. With the but it's got like a pincher on the end, so it's not like like a normal snake. But they're very serpentine and they're, they're cool, and they have big, huge claws on the front. But so they all have six limbs. That's the whole thing with the tyranids. That's like their thing. All the monsters have six six limbs, usually two legs and four arms. I, I don't know because I've seen some. Uh, there's this one guy. I don't I don't remember his name because he's he's on Facebook and a lot of the the miniature painting groups. And I think he has a a YouTube channel too. He does Tyranids in what he calls a coconut crab scheme, which I, I don't know if you guys, have you seen a coconut crab? Do you know yeah. what those are? Mm -hmm. They're like, for anyone that doesn't know what they are, they're these just, they're huge, right? They're, they're really big. I think they're like the biggest crustacean, if I'm not mistaken. And they walk on land. And I guess their whole thing is, I don't know, I don't, they, they live in the Philippines or somewhere out there, that when it's like their time, their mating season, they just walk over whatever is in their way. They don't even care. So it was like, walk through your house, right? And they're they're kind of like um, brownish and orangish and white. They're they're really cool looking. And, and he has a couple of videos of how to paint Tyranid monsters in, in a coconut crab scheme. And it's really cool. It's And it's, it's pretty easy. It's a lot of like dots because a lot of animals like that on their exoskeleton, they, they're patterned with, when you look at it closer, it's a bunch of dots. So I don't know. I might try something like that. Just something different that I've never done before. The coconut crab idea is really cool. I just sent you uh, a little photo of a hybrid blue coconut crab that's awesome looking. It's got those different spots and patterns like you're talking about, but it's got kind of an electric blue tint to it. Really cool. You know what this reminds me of? When we interviewed John Bias, he talked about taking some kind of a really bright coloration that you find in nature and putting it on a model. That's what I see when I see this coconut crab that you just shared. Yeah, I'm excited to see how these are going to turn out, TJ. Yeah, I got to do something different. I mean, I got to do something fun, right? Like, they're giant bug, alien bug monsters. Like, you got to make them look cool, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. I kind of want, you know, kind of want to lean, like, my space marines are, like, camouflaged-ish, you know, all drab, and and the, the bases they're on, you know, they kind of match the base that they're on, which... This I don't know if you saw that comment in the Scale Modelers Critique Group when I posted a bunch of pictures of these the other day. Um, someone pointed that out, which is a valid. It's a valid point. I don't disagree. There's a 
a theme, I'm not necessarily a theme, but a, a general consensus consensus in miniature wargaming that the base that your model is on should contrast with the miniature on the base to make it stand out, which I understand. I, I don't necessarily disagree with that, if that's what you like. As I've explained uh, to multiple people in, in groups and anyone that knows Space Marine lore and Warhammer 40,000 lore, uh, the Raptors paint their armor olive drab for camouflage. So to me, it would go against the theme of my army if I take a green guy and put him on like a bright orange base, like like a Mars like red color base, because you know red contrasts with green. To me, yeah. in the in the lore, the Raptors would just repaint their armor, or they would wear camouflage. They wouldn't run around standing out like sore thumbs. That's just not what they do. Yeah, I've, and it's funny because I've got that comment more than once from different people. And it's, like I said, it's a valid point. I, I don't disagree with it, but I just don't necessarily do it. So I, I kind of feel like maybe with these Tyranids, I could actually do that, do the opposite of what I normally do, make them bright and stand out and contrasty and flashy sort of thing. I think it's a great idea. I think it sounds awesome. As far as contrast and stuff, we all model in our own way. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. And I never would expect somebody to model the way I do or model the subjects I model, you know, or have the same feelings that I have about certain things. Just do what you do. You do you, right? Yes. And I agree with that, especially when it comes to this kind of, especially with, with wargaming and wargaming models. Like, yes, I do agree with you can do whatever you want on anything. You know, I personally don't, if I model like a real world vehicle, if I'm, trying to emulate a picture or something in my, in my head. Yes. I, I try to make it as realistic as possible, but there's nothing realistic about an eight foot tall, genetically engineered, superhuman warrior monk. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't care. That's where you can bring the magic, right? Cause we've talked a little bit about this with Anthony and with Lincoln, where people say it's sci-fi, you can do whatever you want, but you're going to be doing an army. And so everything needs to be consistent. And it needs to look realistic as far as the rules that you establish for your, your guys. Right. Yeah, maybe you're not modeling a prototype, but that needs to be, you know, consistent from piece to piece and that kind of thing. So from that standpoint, the artistic part and the realist realism part is actually, I think, if anything, a little more challenging than modeling a prototype, like a tank or a tractor or an aircraft. Right. I would agree. Well, that's pretty much all I have to say about that, to, to quote Forrest Gump. Oh, um, I got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so enough talking about, you know, little tiny spacemen and alien bug monsters. Let's let's go ahead and shift on over to Doug with Doug's digressions. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Rick, for the name. I love it. I actually want to go a little bit off on a, on a tangent, and I'll get back to it, to, to a modeling subject as I go. There's a local guy here who has a big YouTube following, and following, and he's a reptile guy. He also has a uh, a reptile room, which currently is closed for the COVID. But I was there once, and we were shooting the breeze, and he and we were talking about things we liked, and he found out about modeling, and that uh, one of my current projects was a Warhammer project. That was when I was doing that Lehman Russ tank, and one of his friends who helps out in the reptile room is a Warhammer guy. And the guy that has the reptile room, his name's Clint. Um, he says, says, you know, I used to be really, really bothered by the the level of animosity between reptile people and their opinions, and how somebody thinks one thing and somebody thinks another, and the and the hate they have for each other regarding how to care for reptiles and what to do with them and what's right and what's wrong. And he said, but then I learned about the Warhammer community, and I don't feel so bad anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Truth of that. It, it's true in all of our, in, in any hobby you have, but it's it's really funny how people can get so emotional about such simple things. They are toys, really. I mean, not just Warhammer, but all our models. They're they're just, you know, high-grade I mean, toys. Um, Warhammer really is t toys. <laughs> but they're cool toys. Oh, yeah. I'd yeah. love to have that stuff when I was, you know, 12. That would have been awesome. As we'll find out later in the episode, they're sort of this, fine line between toys and and artwork and uh, that's something to look forward to that we talk about with will pattison definitely so anyway i'm getting back on to the things i love which is star wars 
I don't want to give up anything as far as things that are coming, but I've never been so excited to see TIE fighters in my life. And those of you who follow Mandalorian will know what I mean. Very, very cool stuff. It's got me pumped. I want to build ties. I want ties for Christmas. Tell my kids I want ties. No, <laughs> not those ties. Tie fighters. And tell Banda I want a tie bomber, please. You know what? I'm I'm so pumped to get my model room ready. I want to build some more simpler stuff. I really want to build a slave one now. I've got one in the stash waiting to go. This is exciting. This is a really exciting time. Anybody who who's following what Disney's doing. Oh my gosh. Star Wars is going to explode on us. Um, Scott mentioned earlier when we were just talking before the show, how we waited years and years and years with nothing to do with Star Wars coming out. And now here we are and we're going to get close to a dozen new shows in the next few years. And it's absolutely awesome for me. What's great about it is the decisions that are being made seem to have drifted completely over to given to people who are bigger Star Wars fans than most of us fans are. Oh, and that, that really, that really seems to be informing their choices that they're making on their writing and their subjects and, you know, the direction that they're taking the franchise versus things that were created before. John Favreau is definitely a massive Star Wars fan. I, I heard somebody talk about interviewing him when he was just getting started and that was his dream job was to direct a Star Wars movie. But Dave Filoni, every Star Wars geek in the world combined pales in comparison to Dave Filoni when it comes to their knowledge and love for Star Wars. And you can see it in what he puts out. Seems like with John Favreau, whether it's Elf or Iron Man or the Avengers, it seems like everything he touches is terrific. Oh yeah, he makes good stuff. So anyway, that's that's kind of where where I'm I'm coming from right now is just the excitement to see more Star Wars stuff and hopefully that leads into more Star Wars models in the future. Cool cool stuff. And as far as all of drab being the greatest color ever, I don't know if I can agree with that. <laughs> but and I couldn't pinpoint a specific gray, but somewhere in the grays is the greatest color ever invented, I think. I mean, whether it might be light ghost gray, dark ghost gray, gunship gray, or like sea gray, the dark sea grays they put on the on the Spitfires and Hurricanes. I'll take any of those. I love gray. I thought you were going to say Floquil Reefer White, because isn't that what most of the Rebel ships were painted? I believe they were. But since I don't have Floquil Reefer White, um, I use Tamiya Flat White with a little bit of color added, and it works just fine for me. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I, I put on our Facebook page a link to Archive X, they're making a new line of acrylics and they posted pictures of their R2-D2 blue today. And, oh, it looks great. It's that really deep blue with a with a, just a, the right amount of purple in it to really richen it up. So what about you, Scott? What's going on with you? What are you thinking this week? And what's your favorite color? What is my favorite? I don't know if I have a favorite color. No, that's a good question. Right now, it probably would be L.A. Dodgers blue. I think there's a certain Pantone color, but pretty excited my Dodgers won the World Series. So I ordered my 4K ultra high definition copies of the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the Hobbit trilogy both. Uh, they're not here yet, but I am super stoked uh, to see those. In addition to the 4K transfers, They've had uh, color correction done. Most of the films had kind of a, a greenish tint to them, and they've fixed that. And then they've also added the Dolby Atmos soundtracks to the movie. So I'm really excited for that. I did watch the uh, some comparisons on YouTube comparing the old prints to the, to the new uh, 4K Blu-rays, and definitely a massive uh, upgrade. Yep, I'm pretty stoked about that. And then on the modeling front... Our friends over at Andy's Hobby Headquarters, uh, give them a shout out as usual. But Andy has done a review video on the new Border Models Crusader, which anyone who's been listening knows that I'm just jacked out of my mind to get my hands on. I've got two of the kits on pre-order. From his uh, review and his shots of the sprues, it doesn't look like it's going to disappoint. So I'm Really excited. It sounds like uh, mid-January is probably what I'm looking at for that. Awesome. 
this uh, podcast is going to drop on uh, December 24th. So again, happy holidays to everybody out there listening. And I just wanted to say on behalf of, of myself, how much I just appreciate all of you Posse members out there, the response to this podcast, this little podcast where the three of us who have kind of a shared love of modeling and especially science fiction modeling. We dropped our first episode back in the end of August and uh, thousands and thousands of downloads later, we've just been tremendously, uh, I guess, humbled by the support of the community out there. So I just wanted to take this time to say thanks to everybody. And uh, we've had a, had a great time. We've got to make a whole bunch of new friends. We've had great guests and uh, it's been awesome to talk with you guys about the, model, the modeling hobby that we share. Amen. This is episode 10, and that kind of blows my mind. Um, as of June, I don't think I'd even considered being a part of a podcast until Scott approached me. And uh, yeah, uh, we have friends all over the world now. Friends, people I wouldn't have known otherwise, and I think you all are awesome. And and what's really cool is when when we went sat down to record the first time, I think the three of us had talked once before. I've never met TJ in person, neither is Scott. We've just talked and somehow we sat down and we all kind of clicked together and it's really a fun experience to be part of this yeah i can um i can i have a hard time putting it into words just how how awesome it's been you know to get to share what what i like with some cool dudes you guys and then everyone out there across the world like listening to some nerd that lives in virginia that records podcasts in his basement <laughs> you know it's a uh, <laughs> It's pretty cool, you know, and uh, and on top of that, I've got to meet, for you know, lack of a better term, get to know um, some people, you know, some other model makers that I really like, really look up to, and uh, you know, put right up, <laughs> right up on a pedestal, and I get to meet them and interact with them, and it, it, I don't know, it's a, it's really neat, it's awesome. I mean, it's really, <laughs> it's really the only way you can I can put it. This episode's going to definitely be our our largest of the year, and uh, one of the reasons why is uh, we just had a tremendous interview with Will Pattison. I know most of you out there um, know who he is and are familiar with either uh, the Scale Modeler Critique Group or his social media presence and all the videos that he makes, but it, it's a tremendous interview. I think you're going to really like it. It's it's a really great conversation. It's a little bit deeper dive than a lot of interviews uh, typically are. I think you'll be fascinated with his perspective, and it was a lot of fun to talk to him. What are some of you uh, of your favorites, guys? Uh, whether it's uh, John Bonani, who was our first interview in episode one, or Uncle Night Shift, who was a ton of fun to interview. Uh, um, you know, as I I loved Uncle Night Shift and the John Bias interview. Were, were great for me. Of course, I missed the Lincoln Wright and the Dugues, uh, the Matt McDougall interview, um, unfortunately. But uh, but those two stand out the most to me just because Uncle Night Shift, we've all watched, you know, kind of with awe in what he does with armor. And and uh, John Bias just has such a fabulous way of looking at everything that uh, that it was just it was a, a pleasure to to be able to be part of that. Yeah, they were a lot of fun. TJ, what were some highlights for you? Oh man, um, that's a tough one. That that really is a tough one. I was I, when when Doug was saying what he was saying, I was like running through my mind like who would I would who I would pick. But I mean, I guess you know, uh, gun to my head, I would maybe have to say uh, John John Manani, um, just because <laughs> I. I I like the hell out of that dude. He, he's really awesome. And uh, getting to talk to him was really cool because I, you know, like kind of goes back to what I was saying uh, earlier. You know, he he's one of like the people I look up to the most in modeling. Like, and I've said it, to, I think, to you, Scott, if I could model like anyone, it would be John. Like, I would just steal all of his his talent and just put it into me. And I, oh, man, I'd be so, so pleased because I just something about his finishes just blows me away. I, I I don't know, it's awesome. And getting to talk with him and talk shop with him on top of that, and then get to know him outside of that was just, I mean, it was just cool. 
and get you know? some grilling tips. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, but really, like, I've enjoyed all of our interviews. You know, yeah. they've all been they've all been good. You know, we we've, we've got to know some pretty cool people. Uh, you know, Uncle Night Shift was great. Um, Will was great. Um, Dukes was great. Uh, you know, they, they were all great. J- John Bias was awesome because I've been following his videos for years, you know, for a really long time. So that was cool, too. It's been unbelievable. I'm, I'm the same way. I'm not sure I could tell you a favorite. I mean, because like you said, we started off on a huge high note with John Bonani. And uh, like you said, he be- he's really become a part of the of the podcast in so many ways. You know, he's a co-sponsor of our group build, the T3485 group build. Uh, that was kind of, you know, him and you kind of put that together. And we've got over 200 members in that thing now, which is crazy. And then, you know, we got to speak with uh, David Goldfinch from On The Bench, who's kind of the, you know, kind of the godfather of these scale modeling podcasts. That was so much fun. You guys mentioned, you know, John Bias and, and Uncle Night Shift and how awesome those were. Anthony Goodman, man, I could have talked about old sci-fi with him for hours. You know, we had, you know, Matt and Will, these last two have been great. Lincoln Wright is an absolute blast to, you know, talk to a guy that has been instrumental in Japanese science fiction. You know, just everybody that we've spoken to has just been, just been tremendous. So what a great 2020 And, uh, you know, most importantly of all, I just appreciate all the listeners, all the feedback that we get from each episode. You know, our goal as we started this was to try and give back to the community to try and in some small way is just three of us guys having conversations and trying to fill, you know, that, that growing void of the brick and mortar shops that aren't here anymore or the ones that we're not allowed to go to because of covid and i think it's been uh definitely probably we've gotten a lot more back than you guys have gotten from us but anyway just a just a tremendous year so thank you to all of you out there amen thank you very much all right well i think it's time to let our listeners hear uh, the interview that we have this week which of course is will pattison you know we've referred to him as the hardest working man in scale modeling and uh, you'll definitely hear that uh, this was a tremendous interview. Will's insight was really, really far reaching. A lot of different topics that we touched on. Make sure you stay to the end of this one because this interview uh, dives kind of deep into who Will is and challenges that he he has had and overcome in his life. And he's really a guy that I've always looked up to. And uh, he makes a makes a huge impact on our modeling in so many different ways. And so. Anyway, without further ado, here's our interview with Will Pattison. Welcome to the special guest portion of our show. Today, we are very, very excited to have Will Pattison, the hardest working man in scale modeling, join us. <laughs> For those of you that aren't familiar with Will, he is a man of many talents. He is a professional model maker, photographer, mechanical engineer. He's a tool designer and definitely a tool enthusiast. He's a product tester, YouTuber. He's a frequent social media guest, obviously. He's the co-founder and the full-time admin of one of the largest scale modeling groups on Facebook. He's an author. He's also a class three meme and gif ninja. <laughs> well, welcome to the Plastic Posse. So oh, I, I'm I'm not sure you got the right guy. Uh, that that I don't I'm not sure all that applies to me, but I'm happy to be here nonetheless. Appreciate having you. You uh, recently were on on the bench a couple of times talking tools with the boys down under. Yeah, I guess I three times actually. I didn't realize until they said that that uh, I'm the the lone member of the three time uh, club. That's cool because those guys are fun to hang out with. You know, it's always a good time. Yeah, I called Dave uh, Goldfinch. I called him the Godfather because he kind of started this whole podcasting about scale modeling thing. And of course, Ian and Julian are characters as well. 
Yeah, they've got a great dynamic. And of course, everything you say in Australian is sexy. So <laughs> yeah, we just did a, a short little bit with them that'll be coming up in celebration of the fact that they just hit 100 episodes, which is just a tremendous accomplishment for them. Right. It is. It is. I, you know, as you guys are learning, it's not it's not as simple and easy as they make it sound for sure. I think they've really done a good job of you know, giving us another uh, sort of way to participate or take in our hobby that's not visual. And that's hard, as you guys know. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all right, Will. So thanks for coming on the show. It's kind of interesting uh, way of putting it. You were essentially a scale model influencer. Oh, God. <laughs> influencer kind of has a negative connotation. <laughs> it's not necessarily bad. It's clearly not bad here. You know, do you, do you realize that's what you are? I guess is a, is a good way to start. I don't know. I mean, I when I think of influencers, I think of, you know, those pretty girls on Instagram. Uh, you know, and I'm, <laughs> no, I don't know. Somebody accused Matt McDougal and I of being thought leaders the other day. And I don't know how I feel about that either. I mean, if somebody thinks that I'm leading their thoughts, they might want to get out more. <laughs> I think this is probably true of Matt as well. I mean, I just do what I do. I don't really think of it in those terms. My YouTube channel is just an outlet for me. I like to talk about what I do. I like to pass on the things that I learn. Uh, you know, when I was going through my re-entry into the hobby, I was thirsting for knowledge and I was looking around at all kinds of stuff on YouTube and and I kind of felt like there was a little bit of a hole in the market so to speak and and that also you know has a lot to do with why I do my channel the way I do it it's just me doing my thing so if that makes me an influencer then okay uh, I mean I'm a, I'm a I will only reluctantly accept that title what about artist uh, we kind of talked before you came on we were doing a uh, recording in another segment and I kind of brought this up about considering yourself an artist because uh, <laughs> I was, I'm getting ready to do my first uh, bust. And right. uh, to me, that's, that's like art more than building a tank or mm -hmm. an airplane. How, how do you see that? Well, let me turn it around on you. Cause I think this is, a, this is one of my favorite topics and I'm fascinated by how people view this. Why do you feel like you're being more of an artist when you do a bus than you than you are when you build a tank? Oh, I mean, I don't know, because to me, it seems like, I mean, especially the bus I chose, which is of George Washington in 1796, and it's based off of the famous Lansdowne portrait. So to me, it's almost like trying to, I guess, copy actual piece of fine art. You know, I mean, I don't think there's any question that that's a fantastic painting of mm -hmm. like the most sure. famous man in America. Right. But to me, like trying to do that, even though it's not on a canvas, it's on a piece of resin. To me, that feels more actual, like thinking about art, I guess. I got you. You're dealing with volumes and light more so than you would if you're trying to build a realistic representation of a tank, just a small version of one. Like, I don't know, to me, there's just a different, set of skills that that maybe I, I don't know if I necessarily have or could exercise the same making mud as one I guess skill but trying to recreate volumes on a miniature to me is like that's the close that's closer to I guess what I would consider fine art than building a Sherman well you're you're touching on a whole on a whole bunch of my buttons for sure <laughs> well, this is good this is good. One of them is is the fine art thing. I could go on about that because, you know, we, you guys mentioned my photography background, and that's one of those things in the photography world that drives me absolutely batty because you have photographers who advertise themselves as fine art photographers. And even worse, you have products like fine art photography paper. I, I even saw a guy on the internet peddling boxes for storing your photographs in, and they were fine art photography storage boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I find it really pretentious and sort of self-congratulatory when people 
declare themselves that way because it's kind of like, really? I mean, how do you know it's that fine? I mean, is that your own opinion of your own work or did somebody tell you that it was really fine? You know, I don't know. I, and I, I, I believe in humility in these things. And so I, it just kind of, it just kind of makes the fur on the back of my neck stand up when people are referring to their own stuff like that. Can I, can I add something? Sure. I, I don't mind at all when I look at what I do and I say, I'm basically playing with toys. I'm making them nicer than a regular toy, but it's a toy to me, but I see what some other people are doing and there's no way in my mind that that's not art. Yeah. I, think- I actually knew uh, years and years ago, I worked with this, this young woman whose mother was an artist, a true artist. Cause she, she told me all about it. She painted <laughs> on canvas and she insisted that model building was just crafts. <laughs> right. It was just crafts, and it was so elitist to me. It was like, are you kidding me? So you're, it's, it's, it's basically, I'm looking down my nose at you because you're putting pl- paint on plastic, and you know that already is shaped and stuff, and you're not yeah. really doing any of that. So, so what we've arrived at is coming from both directions, both from people who are in the arts, feeling superior because they do art and projecting that on other people so that they can stroke them their own egos. And then folks who are viewers or consumers of the arts feeling like it's some kind of magic and that there's no relation to anything that they may themselves do. And coming from both directions, it's the unfortunate use of the term art as a qualifier. That's that's a major beef that I have. Let, let me okay. I've got my phone here. Uh, let me see if I can uh, just very quickly. If I type in the word art in the search bar, let's just see what it says. Art is a diverse range of human activities involving the creation of visual, auditory, or performing artifacts which express the creator's imagination, conceptual ideas, or technical technical skill intended to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. Okay, so for me, that's a noun. Art is a noun. It has a definition. It's not a qualitative term. And I think this is the mistake that, that a lot of folks make. Art is just a thing, and if you produce that thing, you are therefore an artist. I mean, to me, it's that simple. That doesn't say anything about how good it is, right? Because we've all seen stuff that was called art, and we were like, seriously? You're kidding me now, right? I mean, wasn't there a guy a few years ago who buried a plane in uh, the sand in uh, some Middle Eastern country and declared that it was an artistic statement on the Middle Eastern conflict. And we were all like, dude, you dug a hole and put a plane in it. (laughs) I was Googling your Industria Mechanica Cosmonaut, and I've got it up in front of me. And based on the definition that you just read to us, this is art. It's very evocative. It certainly conveys um, emotion as well as the degree of realism that you intended to put into it. It's beautiful to look at. I mean, it definitely is a piece of art. Well, you know, and and I want to say thank you because that feels good, but not because I feel like you like it, but because I feel like you recognized that I was doing all the things that I did to make it turn out that way with a specific vision in mind. And I utilized my skills and my knowledge of of materials and, and techniques to get there. And to me, that's that, that's all it takes for something to be art. And honestly, I don't think anybody other than the person doing it gets to decide. Sure, you can look at it and at a thing and you can, in, in many cases, it's pretty easy to surmise. Okay, that's art. But not necessarily because like, let's take, uh, I mean, Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's a good example because at that time it was a thing to hire apprentices who produced essentially copies of the artist's work. Like Rembrandt had a whole workshop full of guys basically churning out stuff. 
And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be an art historian because I'm far from that. But point being is you could look at one of those copies and there was lots of technical skill applied, obviously, by these apprentices. But it wasn't really their intent because they're basically just doing what Rembrandt told them to do. So you might look at a thing and think, oh, that has to be art. But even then, it may not necessarily be true. And so I kind of think that it's really between the creator and the work itself to decide. It's only up to the rest of us to decide if we like it or not. It's very, very subjective, like a painting or like a like in music, for instance. If, if someone's a really, really good vocalist, you have the words that they're singing, but they can actually evoke images and emotions with the way that they sing it, not just the words that they're singing. A hundred percent. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and likewise, well, I, I, I think it, I think it's really kind of a simple thing to decide if what we do is or isn't. I mean, if you take a kit out of the box and you put it together and you paint it exactly the way the color call out tells you to, you stick the decals on there. And when it's finished, it looks exactly like the picture on the front of the box. I'd be hard pressed to call that art as well. But to me, the second that you start putting your own spin on it, whether it's a tank or an airplane or a bus, it doesn't really matter. The second you start trying to create a story with weathering, you're moving into the art world in that moment, in my opinion, because now you're using your skills and your knowledge to, to tell a story and produce an emotional effect. And hopefully, you know, something that's visually pleasing. Yeah, I think a lot of better modelers would, would all tell you that too. You know, we had Martin Kovach here, who I, I know you know well. And, oh. you know, he met, he mentioned that the way that he weathers his models isn't realistic. You know, he, he's after a certain a certain look, a certain interpretation of what he thinks armored vehicles look like. And, and he openly acknowledges that, yes, this isn't life realistic. This is my interpretation of that. Yeah, and, and I give him a hard time about his refusal to admit that he's an artist because he 100% is. And it's not just because his work is so amazing. It's because it's all that very intentional use of skills and knowledge to produce a, a certain effect. In fact, today is the uh, 5th of December. Have you guys watched the video that he released yesterday? Yeah, I haven't yet. Mm -hmm. Not yet. I have. He uh, gets into a couple of things that I think are really powerful, but he almost, he drops it in there so casually that I think that a lot of guys are going to overlook what he's saying. He talks a lot about using weathering to highlight the surface that he's working on. You know, it's real easy to think of weathering. Okay, I want to put some dirt on this thing. I want to add some mud here. You know, I want to put an oil stain there, whatever it is. And, and that's obviously the first layer of it. And, and that's that's kind of a kind of a given. But what he's doing that goes a level beyond that is he's using those effects to call attention to or magnify surface geometry in such a way that it gives the whole piece a lot more depth. And to me, that's fascinating. And I think that a lot of us just tend to blow right by that. And when I, within minutes after watching that, I sent him a private message on Facebook. And I was like, dude, when are you going to just come out of the closet and admit that you're an artist already? <laughs> yeah, he, he's, he's pretty adamant that he's not an artist, but I, I'm in your camp on that for sure. Yeah, he's full of crap. And I'll, and I'll tell him that straight up. And so the point there, you know, back to what you, got, you were saying earlier about your George Washington bust you know, yeah, okay, you're you're adding volume, you're creating depth, you're doing shadows and highlights. Yeah, absolutely, because you're making your interpretation of the thing. You're getting into the to the artistic side of things. Absolutely. But on the other hand, if you're just painting by numbers and you just copy that painting that you referenced, not not necessarily as much, even though it's it's a bust. So, you know, I just feel like it doesn't really matter what the subject is. It's how you, it's how you treat it. It's how you approach it and uh, what kind of stories you're trying to tell with it. Yeah, that's a fair point. Now, having said that, I, I absolutely do not run around telling people that I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will say I try to be. I'm, I'm trying to do art. 
because that's the truth. I am trying to produce things that have a style that's unique to me, that tell a story that I want to tell and that I, you know, achieve through hopefully skillful use of, of materials and, and knowledge. But have I arrived there? You know, I don't, uh, mostly I don't feel that way. I, I mostly feel like I'm still, still at the beginning of the journey. Wow. That's a whole nother question. Is it, is it a destination or is it a journey? Oh, I think it's, I think it's definitely a, a journey. I, I don't know that any real artist will, will, and, and I, and I even cringe at myself using the term real artist. It, I, let me give you an example. Okay. I, in my photography days, I was fortunate enough to have dinner with a group of world-class photographers. One of them was a guy named Joe McNally. And Joe has the distinction of shooting more National Geographic covers than any other photographer in history. Like he's got work in the Smithsonian. You say Joe McNally in any room full of photographers and pretty much everybody's going to know who who he is. He was talking about being on a, a shoot in Hawaii and... All the conditions were perfect. Everything was going his way. And he would still get up in the morning practically weeping with anxiety because he didn't know that he would have it that day. To me, that's just something I've never forgotten. Those guys are never satisfied. They're never convinced that they've arrived. They're always searching. So I'm the last guy that's ever going to declare that I have found my destination. I think you're right. One of my favorite musicians of all time was Neil Peart of Rush. Halfway in, in, in his career, he was pretty much universally lauded as the best rock drummer on the planet. But instead of just kind of kicking back and saying, I'm the best I've arrived, he actually tore his complete technique and method down and rebuilt it and studied with other drum masters so that he could become better at what he did. And I, I think that's. That's what you're saying with the, you know, your photographer as well, that even if you are an artist that's producing tremendous works, the fact that you have that passion to keep improving, I think, is what sets those artists apart from their peers. Yeah, the, the, definitely. It's a, it's, a, it's, a kind of, it's a kind of madness, honestly. Hey, that's actually a good segue into what else I wanted to talk about, trying to get better at yourself or with what you do. Scale Modeler's Critique Group. Uh, on Facebook. Well, I'm sure anyone that watches your videos has probably heard you talk about it. I do. Yeah. I personally would like to thank you for that group because that's actually how I met Scott. So, and then what I by heard. extension met Doug. So that's what I heard. I don't know. You guys may feel like I should apologize, but I kind of feel like a proud papa. <laughs> no, you should. You should be. I, I am very appreciative of it. Can you, uh -oh, let's talk about that a little bit. Like how, where did the, the idea spring from and really how did you get that ball rolling? Well, um, it was, uh, it was a joke. <laughs> Honestly, it was a little bit of a joke between, uh, between Matt and myself, uh, and Jim, the three of us, you know, were just, we're kind of like Facebook private messenger buddies and constantly kind of chatting amongst ourselves. And, we we were grumbling about the fact that pretty much every Facebook group kind of disallowed any sort of honest feedback. You know, like there are groups that specifically say, hey, don't give any feedback, don't give any critique. Uh, and what they really mean is is negative critique unless it's asked for. And that's fine. You know, those groups run the, you know, that that's that's what they how they choose to run their show and that's totally cool. But we wanted a place that was a little less a little less cushioned, maybe that's the right word, I don't know, cuz like I in particular, I just am wired to want feedback. And I don't care if it's if it's bad. I mean, good or bad. Obviously, good. We we all love getting positive reviews, but what we recognize is that that's not the way to growth. If, everybody, if, if you're just constantly being told that you're doing great, you know, what incentive do you have to work harder or learn more? So anyway, we just wanted a place that was a little bit different. We wanted a place where it was like, okay, this is the deal. Uh, let's be honest. Let's be open. 
about what, you know, what's what we want to learn and, and, and what we're looking at. So um, <laughs> the, the idea came up in that conversation that we should call it the your scale model sucks group. <laughs> <laughs> You know, after after a good chuckle, I was like, "Yeah, I don't really think that's going to work," uh, and we ended up with with what we did. The rest, as they say, is history. I suppose. You know, we've been through some growing pains and that sort of thing, but I honestly can say, for for on behalf of both Matt and myself and the the other three guys that that help us run it, that we are very proud of where that thing has ended up. So why do you think honest feedback is so controversial? And, you know, I've seen it bandied about that, oh, it's because the younger generation is too sensitive, but yet it's always some old guy raging about how people are mean to him and doesn't say his, frankly, not good model is the best thing ever. Yeah, this is not a battle that's drawn along age lines as far as I can tell. You know, we've we've had uh, well, he has not been in there in a long time. We miss him. We had a kiddo in there named Colin Arthur's back in the early days, who was fourteen when we found him. We found him on some forum, and we just recognized that he was super enthusiastic and he was really trying hard and pushing to to include the most detail possible in every one of his projects, and we actively recruited him. You know, he found girls and beer and all that stuff, I guess, and he and he's moved on. But there was no age issue there. So I don't think that's it. I have noticed a phenomenon where there are people who insist in the most impolite terms that it's really rude to offer any sort of critique if it's not asked for, which I find kind of ironic. It doesn't matter how polite said critique is their their view is that the fact that you opened your mouth at all is rude so i think some of it is just a matter of social values i also think that you know we're human beings we have fragile egos sometimes you know it's not always comfortable to be challenged yeah the whole ethos of scale modelers critique group has been a bit disruptive in some ways for some folks which just makes us even more committed. <laughs> well, yeah, because that's one of the other things I wanted to bring up <laughs> because, I mean, I've seen it. I haven't had it directed towards me, fortunately, but there's a lot of people that do not like the fact that this group exists, like, at all. That's 100%, 100% true. I don't understand how the existence of a Facebook group could be anathema to your existence, but apparently that's a thing. There are there are some haters out there for, for sure <laughs> who definitely feel that way, and it's it, I mean honestly it's a consistent source of amusement for us. I hope that those guys aren't spending any time thinking we're bothered by their disapproval because it's that's just not. The <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it's I I guess it could be a small comfort that you're you guys are living in their head rent free twenty four seven. Hey, you know, that is that is kind of fun. I mean, I'd I'd be just as happy if they all went away. <laughs> that, that's never going to happen. And, and that's fine. I, you, you know, the truth is, we just don't spend any time worrying about it. We're doing our thing. This is another one of those sorts of phenomenon that I that I notice with these things is you get uh, these people who complain about rivet counters bashing everybody's work. And tearing down somebody's efforts. And I'm just kind of baffled because I, I mean, I spend a lot of time on there and I just really don't see it. I mean, very often, if ever, uh, certainly not with the frequency that's assigned to it. I mean, you, you know, you'll occasionally see somebody who will say, well, that's the wrong color. And, and that might be a little tactless, um, I think sometimes you have to take into account differences in uh, first language, but I just generally don't see the bullying and the meanness and the rudeness that's ascribed to these so-called monsters of rivet counting. I just think that there's uh, I mean, we know that there's lots of model makers who just want to build casually. They want to just put something on their shelf that looks neat, 
that represents their favorite airplane or car or whatever. And that's, and that's totally cool. No, nobody should judge that. You know, nobody has the right to judge why or how you choose to pursue your pastimes. But there's also this sort of subset who are like militantly against trying to be better. You know, we get called elitists all the time as, as the, you know, the, the guys who run SMCG and there's, and in some places you'll find there's almost this assumption that if you're even a member of it, that you're some kind of an elitist. You guys have spent enough time in there to know that that's just silly. We just don't care. We're too busy trying to learn how to do stuff. There's, there's definitely a lot of truth to that. I mean, first of all, when somebody gets out of line, you or the mods are really, really quick to put a, an end to it. And that includes uh, putting them on uh, sleep for a couple of days <laughs> or, or whatever is required. SMCGs really helped me in particular to, first of all, not be afraid to question what we do as modelers, try new techniques, try new products, try new ways of lo- looking at things, but then also using that honest feedback element to say, okay, that feedback smarts a little bit, but honestly, it's correct. And so what am I going to do to get better? That's a powerful moment. That's why we built the group. You know, we, we, we wanted a safe space for those of us who are just a little crazier, who, you know, who are just a little more obsessed. And I feel like, I feel like we've done that pretty effectively. I mean, you know, we haven't been perfect. We've, we've had our missteps and, you know, all I can say is that, that we, we've tried to at least be consistent and fair, recognizing that it's not the group for everybody. I mean, we've been pretty static at something like 11,000 members for a long time, where other groups have grown to, you know, 30, 40, 50,000. And we're totally okay with that. I, I honestly never expected the thing to grow beyond a few hundred. 11,000 is still a little shocking to me. But I, we always f- were firm that qu- quality was way more important than quantity for us. Scott, you kind of touched on what I was going to bring up about how the honest feedback loop, I guess, for lack of a better term, has, has changed your approach to modeling. Because I know it's made me better personally, for what it's worth, I guess, since I joined do you feel like it's done that for you too, Will? Oh yeah. I mean, my, my my secret agenda was, hey, if we could, you know, get a group full of craftsmen who aren't afraid to give honest feedback, I can get them to check my pictures all the time and tell me when I'm screwing up. <laughs> so, so you know, it's definitely improved my game. I, I mean, there's been a number of times where I've thrown something out there. Because it's it, basically, it's just part of my process. I'm constantly taking iPhone pictures at my bench and posting them up there. I do that so that I can get a different look at my own photos. Because then I go look at them on, my, on a big screen uh, and see things that I didn't see when I looked at them on my phone. But I know that I've got a bunch of guys in there looking at them who aren't afraid to say, Yo, dude, what were you thinking? Well, and I think in order to get the most out of the group too, Will... It isn't just receiving feedback, it's actually giving feedback. And it's giving feedback that you've invested some intelligent thought into that makes that group so valuable. I think that makes you a better modeler, but also maybe a better human too. I absolutely agree because giving good feedback is, I mean, it takes energy, it takes time and it takes energy. And if you can't think through why you're saying the thing you're saying about somebody else's work, then chances are you're not thinking about it in terms of your own work. So it, it is, it's, it's a, that's why they call it a feedback loop, I guess. It helps everybody involved. It helps you, it helps the receiver, and it helps all of the people who are witnessing it. I think it's invaluable. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful, you know, for all of the feedback that I've gotten. There have been a number of times when those guys in there have saved me from embarrassing myself. And I, I'm grateful for that. Your YouTube channel, which actually is, if I recall, how I found SMCG, that you had mentioned in your video, and I found you randomly on YouTube, Mm -hmm. since uh, my words aren't working today. (laughs) You've been on YouTube since 2011, correct? 
No, I think my first YouTube video was 2014. Yeah, that has to be right. Been at it about six years. Yeah, yeah. That and I don't and I and I don't know what's up with that. I I I mean I I may have had a YouTube account since 2011, but I didn't make a video about scale modeling. Uh, oh, I know why it's 2011. I know why, because I had some videos in there uh, regarding my journey through spinal cord injury. Those were on there way before my first scale modeling video. That's that's the deal. My first scale modeling video was was about almost exactly six years ago now. So your videos are interesting. I personally really enjoy <laughs> them, uh, and th- th- that's not. I, did, I was trying to think of a the best term I could, you know, you're trying, you're best adjective I could find. It, it's okay, man. You don't you don't have to be polite. It's okay. But I, I don't I don't want you to, to <laughs> take that like a, as an insult because I personally really like your videos. Especially your really long ones. Um, I, I, I like your ten minutes. Of, well, they're usually longer than ten minutes right. of random, but I really enjoy those. But so, so I used to work overnights, so your hour plus videos were awesome because it gave me something to do. Because I was at work by myself for hours, it gave me something to listen to, something to watch. Is that just how you feel like you should do it, or, or is there something like? Are you aiming to make long videos because you know when we talked to martin he was like oh you know short videos usually perform better because he's you know he's really concerned about the analytics which i know a lot of some other youtubers i follow outside of this hobby and it, within the hobby also talk about their analytics yeah do you what do you prefer to do i guess do you do you like the shorter videos or, or do you <laughs> So I guess you're kind of known for the long, longer videos. Oh I, I yeah, guess. I definitely am known for the longer videos. There's no doubt about that. I mean, it's a running joke in SMCG that you know if you if you're struggling with insomnia, you know, just <laughs> go to my <laughs> channel. <laughs> so, yeah, I, and and I yeah I take it in stride. But the truth is, I annoy myself all the time because they're you know because I'm rambling, and I don't like to. But it is what it is, and it's for a couple of reasons. I mean, I do actually sort of like the long form. Like, I don't know, do any of you guys listen to the Joe Rogan experience? I do not. I don't. Okay, well, Joe is the is kind of the godfather of, of sorry, don't take offense at this, real podcasts. Uh, <laughs> Joe is, I mean, he recently inked a hundred million dollar deal with Spotify and he's known for his episodes being two to three hours long and it's real and it's authentic because, you know, his guests say they get into real conversation. It's not these little sound bites. I like that. I admire that uh, because I get sick and tired of talking heads on TV saying what they think we want to hear. And uh, so I do feel like there's a certain level of authenticity to just taking as long as it takes. And that is, that is part of, of what happens with me. I feel like I owe it to anybody who's watching to give them the best information that I can. One of the things that frustrated me when I was going through watching so many YouTube videos was just not finding enough detail, not finding enough depth in the explanations of how to do things or why to do things. And, and that may be the most important thing of all is the why. You know, if you read Mike Rinaldi's books, have you guys read like Tank Art, uh, any of his Tank Art books? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, he spends a lot of words in there telling you why. And he repeats a lot of it. I think that's hugely important if you want to work towards a higher level. I, I just feel an obligation, I guess. And then there's the fact that I'm just lazy and I'm not writing no scripts. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I have mad respect for Martin and the fact that he scripts those things and yet still makes it seem so natural and off the cuff. And I'm jealous of his ability to knock it out in 10 or 15 minutes but I'm not jealous enough to write a script. <laughs> well, two, mil- two million views later, I think a few people agree with you. I, you know what? I, I do feel like 
I mean, yeah, I get the occasional clown in my comments who's like, you sure must like hearing yourself talk, you know, or you way too many words, just get to the point. And I'm like, okay, uh, yeah, all right. I understand that I'm rambling a bit at times and I may stray off into uh, sidelines, still feel like the quality of the information I'm putting out there is, is pretty good. I'm pretty committed to not stating an opinion unless I've tested it. I'm pretty committed to not putting something out there as a fact, unless I know where to verify, how I can verify it. And I make mistakes. I mean, I still get uh, people giving me a hard time for saying something about spark plug wires on a diesel engine once. (laughs) I know guys, I know they don't have them, but you know, I mean, so I'm not perfect, but I don't, you know, I don't know. I I feel like the information I put out there is pretty good. And I do get a lot of really nice comments. Uh, I mean, the nice things that people say in my comments and in, and I get a lot of private messages from people on Facebook who have, who have found me after watching my videos. And some of them are honestly really heartwarming. I had a message from a guy this morning, in fact, uh, saying that he uh, suffered a very bad injury from a motorcycle accident. And he's been struggling to find a way to kill the noise in his head as a result of the depression, he's tried a bunch of other hobbies and scale modeling is the first thing he's found that quiets the, the, the noise down for him. And, you know, I got a little choked up just reading that message. One of those messages is worth a hundred nice job messages. And certainly worth you know putting up with a few guys who are irritated at the sound of my voice oh no question no question that's incredible so that was a very long answer to what you probably thought was a very simple question (laughs) (laughs) yeah my channel is that way because that's the way it is okay i you know another thing that i always find interesting and i'm sure a lot of other people do uh as a as a content creator yourself what other content creators do you enjoy and what what do you look for in another youtube content creator it, not necessarily in scale modeling just in in general uh martin <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can you never go wrong with choosing him i mean i'm a i'm a an un, unabashed fanboy i mean cuz look he's just a cool guy and he keeps it you know he keeps it real and he throws in these little funny things that you know come out with his czech accent like cash money or my friends i you know i laugh every <laughs> single time but on a purely technical level he's just doing it right i mean he you know he his explanations are really good he talks about why he's doing what he's doing at least as much as what he's doing and his close ups this is the thing that that frustrates me more than anything with almost all of these youtube guys in scale modeling is the close ups are just not close we i mean what we do is is, is just by its very nature a close up thing and you, if you can't see the work happening in a, at a really magnified range for me anyway it's almost not worth watching so I just, he's just doing everything right. I watch uh, Alex Steele a lot. Are you guys familiar with him? He's great. Yeah, Yeah. he is. He's great. And, and, and he's a, he's a fellow madman. (laughs) I mean, you guys, you guys have all seen the episodes where he's like, you know, he's done something that looks amazing. Right. And he's like, Nope, gonna redo that because of this little scratch right here. And he, you know, he's got no fear. He's like, uh, you know, I'm just like, okay, I, I just hope to have that kind of intestinal fortitude when I'm evaluating my own work. So I like him a lot. I, you know, I watch uh, Adam Savage uh, tested quite a bit. Um, Another good one. Yep. Yeah. I mean, he, he occasionally does something that really kind of hits closer to home with us. But even if he doesn't, I just enjoy hearing the thoughts of a true craftsman. 
and he he definitely is. So I, I would say those three. I, I mean, there's a lot, there's there's a lot of others that I watch, but but those three are kind of my standout channels that that uh, I'm always looking, you know, for the for the latest episodes. So you've hit on it a little bit, but what other uh, interests do you have? Other hobbies uh, besides scale modeling? Well, I mean, I'm honestly a little bit of a of a of a workaholic. I in the just the nature of my life being what it is, I spend a lot of my time doing something that's related to scale modeling. Farming reference photos is kind of a sub hobby that feeds the real hobby. I'm an addict. Uh, I, I spend a lot of time, you know, gardening my little collection of, of photos. So there's that photography, you know, that turned from a, from a hobby into a, a profession and now back to a, a hobby. So there's that. Honestly, my spinal cord injury took away my, my favorite things. So my life has fewer dimensions now than it did before. And I've just, you know, I, I've just tried to make the things that I can still do as fulfilling as possible. But yeah, no more skiing, no more dirt bikes, uh, you know, none of those things. Uh, no more uh, welding to speak of. Uh, I occasionally get to do a little bit, but I always loved metal fabrication, uh, a little bit of woodworking. I mean, you can kind of see some common threads through all these things, I suppose. Cool. And uh, when it comes to modeling, you do a lot of, you do commission builds. Um, mm -hmm. How did you get into that? How did you get started with commission builds? Well, uh, to be fair, I, 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 I will do, I can be persuaded. I, I, I do not consider my, I do not consider myself a commission builder. You know, it's it's purely a matter of of somebody throwing enough cash at me, right? Because who knows who knows what it what it actually takes to build something. I I've had too many people say I gave you fifty bucks for that. You know, yeah, and you no, just say well that took me fifty hours to build. So right, right. <laughs> I and it and it doesn't it, it for me it's not just about the cash because because I've I've been well paid for the things that I have agreed to do on commission. And it still doesn't come anywhere close to paying any bills. Not only does there have to be enough money involved, but I have to like you and I have to be interested in what you want me to do. You know, if, if somebody comes at me wanting me to, you know, build a, a Argentine Tucano, okay, that's a beautiful airplane, but I have zero interest in making, spending any of my time building one for, for somebody just not going to happen. And I'll, and I'll say, and I've turned down jobs uh, for that very reason. I got really lucky. The guy that I've done the most commission work for found me on YouTube and he approached me uh, and he is actually a, a, a serious art collector, mostly painting, but he also happens to be a world war II aviation enthusiast and he thought he was going to do some model making of his own and realized that he just didn't have the time or the commitment. And so he approached me about doing some stuff for him. And my first response was, you're not going to pay what it's going to cost. And he was like, try me. So, <laughs> uh, Bring it on. Yeah. So I, I did. And he was like, all right. How long, how much time do you need? <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it was really like, you know, the, the greatest date. Uh, well, the maybe like the, the blind date turning into, a, you know, a, a really sweet relationship because he and I ended up being friends and he never badgered me about how long it was going to take. He said, I don't care. I just want the best that you know how to do. And when I wanted to do something a little bit outside the lines, he would always listen to me. And if I could sell him on why I thought it had artistic merit, he'd be like, go for it, you know? 
and he recognized the value of my time and my and my efforts and uh he had no problem paying for it so yeah it was uh, i haven't done anything for him for a while uh but uh it was very rewarding cool was there is there a, any specific one that you've done that you uh that stands out to you that you you are most fond of yeah um i did uh you, you guys might might remember the spitfire that i built the tamia uh, 130 second spitfire that i built i guess i finished it to, i finished it last year i think uh last yeah. last winter that's th- that one because he uh, has a huge love affair with spitfires and he had been talking to me for a long time about doing a spitfire you know he and i spent a lot of time figuring out what was going to be representative of what he wanted while still staying within my style and allowing me to do and express my own vision for it. (laughs) Even down to putting the LOL call letters on it. (laughs) That was a little bit of a sales job on my part, but he loved me, but he loved, but he loved the joke. You know, he got the historic pun, and uh, and so we did it. And so, yeah, that that that's pretty much got. It's going to be tough to, for for anything to to supplant that one as my favorite. I'm sure you talk about this on your on your channel and stuff. Do you have any any models that you built just for yourself that that um, you would love to build more of, or do you tend to want to build one of each and just build as many as you can? Yeah, you know that I I struggle with that because it for me each project is a is a journey. I start, I mean, I st- it's a journey that starts with a specific destination in mind. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. like I typically have pictures in my head of what I want the thing to look like before I even open the box, and I and I pour so much of myself into it that usually by the time I'm done, I'm like ne- never again. Having said that, somehow I've built like half a dozen Spitfires. I love the things. They're certainly one of my favorite planes, but I I would never have calculated that I would end up building as a percentage more Spitfires than anything else I've built. Because I'm not one of those guys who's like, oh, I just love Mustangs so much. I'm going to build nothing but Mustangs. But I kind of could, you know, because there's so many of them that are so interesting. So there's that side, but then there's been some other projects I've done that I just really, really loved, uh, that, that I just don't feel like I could do again. Like they just, they, they were just unique enough within the range of what I do that I just, I wouldn't even want to try to do it again. So I don't know if that makes sense or not. No, that makes sense. I am very fond of star Wars. It's my thing. And I build a lot of Bandai stuff. Yeah. Um, there are some of those kits that I've built multiples of and will build more of the AT, a, the ATST and the, the Y wing in particular. And right. there's others that I've built and I loved them, but I just don't feel any interest in doing more. Yeah. I, I can relate because, you know, like, uh, I mean, I love the sorts the star Wars stuff too. I've never built any of it, but my sci-fi thing has been the machine and Krieger stuff, you know, the Falca, the Griffin, those things are just super fun kits to build. They're super simple, but they're not representative of really any kind of storyline or anything other than what Ko Yokoyama envisioned for them. But I have like half a dozen of those things in my head just waiting to be built. That's very cool. I'm looking forward to that. I mean, they're just, they're just so much fun, but I don't allow myself to fall into that because or I, or I don't get around to it because I, I have other projects that are more one-off things. And I, and I've like, feel like I shouldn't, I don't want to become a one trick pony. Yeah. It's, it's a conflict. I fight with myself over what to build all the time. In the spirit of that answer, one of my favorite uh, model builds that you've done was the one where you made kind of the, the Mad Max uh, Spitfire truck (laughs) combo thing, you know, where you, you go off of a, kit template and just kind of do your own thing any desire to maybe do another project similar to that anytime soon <laughs> the the spitador uh called that publicly because it was a combination of a 
Spitfire and a and an AEC Matador gun truck, but <laughs> privately called the the Spitatard by my friends. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I had so much fun doing that thing, uh, and I would and I do. I have other ideas for similar silliness, but again, the more real stuff gets in the way, and I get so knee deep in uh you know like i'm building a p40 right now and i'm just all about p40s and p40 reference photos and 3d printing parts for it and i just i get sucked down the rabbit hole way far and it's hard for me to it, it's yeah I, I like i said i fight with myself over this well i just want to thank you again for being on with us this has been an amazing conversation getting kind of deep into your mind and your thoughts. It's pretty awesome. And uh, it's a pretty scary place. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a pretty interesting rabbit hole for sure. It's like we were just talking about the Spitador. I think my favorite part of that whole build is that one little bright red rear view mirror that you put on it. It's those little details. And that's kind of what we're talking about. You know, the little secrets and everything. Those, I like those incongruities, I think is the right word. Uh, those little Easter egg kind of things. Those are those are one of my favorite things to do. I understand you've kind of gotten into uh, some tool design a little bit when you were on with the on the bench guys they were talking about like a, a jig that you had designed and kind of sent to them can you talk about that a little bit yeah that's uh just been another one of those things where i sort of fell into a a relationship that's turned out to be really cool and productive and that's with john geigel you guys have seen his name around he owns masterpiece models which is up in uh, vancouver washington and john is a yeah, I mean, he's an OG industrial model maker, you know, like he posts some pictures of stuff they're doing in their shop sometimes that, you know, like they're building quarter scale replicas of the Hubble telescope that gets hung in a museum, you know, that kind of, that kind of model making. Anyway, somehow he and I became, became buddies and he's always after me with new ideas. And sometimes I'm like, I have to be like, dude, no. That's not, <laughs> calm, calm, calm down. That's, you know, I get why you think it's cool, but, but, you know, we'll brainstorm. And, and so we've come up with some different things in that jig, which is called the Benchmate, came about because I had bought a, uh, and what we're talking about is a fixture for, for aircraft modelers, mostly that you know, lets you attach the model to the fixture so that you can do whatever kind of operations you need to do to it without actually handling the model. You handle the fixture instead. And I had one of those that was made out of laser cut plywood and it was fine, but I had frustrations with it. Not easy to adjust one handed, especially as clumsy as I am. So John was like, well, dude, design a better one and let's sell it. So, all right. Because I do have an engineering background, the ability to, to run a free personal use license of Fusion 360 on my Mac at home in my underwear. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's it's just so different from when I was working as an engineer 20 years ago. So it, it's I guess, you know, you know, you guys asked me about my hobbies. I guess maybe doing a little bit of side engineering work is almost like a hobby. Yeah, I just uh, I jumped in there and, and, and designed that thing, and it's proven to be uh, pretty popular. So I, I'm, I'm grateful to John for uh, encouraging me to do that and, and for being supportive. Yeah. Yeah, you need a tool that you don't have, which is kind of hard to believe sometimes. <laughs> right? With me, the guy who will, yeah, basically buy and try any tool. Yeah. The un the unofficial Proxon uh, sales representative, I think if they uh, took a look at the numbers, you might be uh, in line for a position with their company <laughs> for sure. You know, I just, I keep it real. I, if I like it, I'm going to say I like it. If I don't like it, I'll say that too. But I just, when I find something that really works for me, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to talk about it. That Proxon stuff, man, I love it. It is good stuff. All right. Well, if you look into your crystal ball, got one more uh, geeky uh, tool question for you. 
in 10 years from now, how big of a role is 3D printing going to gonna play in our hobby? And uh, do you think it's a threat or do you think it's just something that's going to make our hobby much, much better? Very cool question. And uh, it's, <laughs> it's kind of funny because five years ago, I could frequently be found to say things like, yeah, it's just not any good for what we're doing and it's not likely to be any good anytime soon and all kinds of other silly things that obviously have proven not to be true. And I've never been more happy to be wrong about something. I What a lot of people don't know is that I kind of grew up in 3D printing because that's what I went to grad school on. I was working as an intern, as an engineering intern, getting ready to go to grad school for my master's in mechanical engineering. And I came across an article in a magazine about 3D systems and stereolithography. And I just instantly was like, that's what I want to do. And this was 25 years ago. Uh, My first job after grad school actually was with a company that at the time was on the bleeding edge of 3D printing. Uh, So I've been attached to it a little bit, at least for a long time. I have seen it, especially in the last five years, make this amazing transmogrification into a into a consumer thing. You know, and, and, and keeping in mind that like SLA printers, which is that's what an anti-cubic photon or a frozen sonic mini or an Eligu Mars, those are all SLA printers, no matter what other initialisms are attached to them. When those things were invented, they were $500,000 laboratory scale machines that were lucky if they could make a cube to within plus or minus 10 thousandths of an inch. Yeah. And, you know, look at the kind of things we're doing with them now for 300 bucks on our workbench tops. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's just amazing. And you combine that with things like having Fusion 360 at home for free. It's unbelievable what we can do. Certainly not a threat. It, it's opening up a whole other layer of scale modeling for guys that want to pursue that, that I think is just super cool and a lot of fun. And I'm really proud that SMCG is kind of becoming a, a repository of, of users and knowledge in, in, for that particular thread. Uh, we got a bunch of guys in there who, who have machines and are doing amazing things with them. I think it's all positive. Now, having said all that, do I think that it's going to, in 10 years' time, or in any number of years' time, take the place of an injection-molded kit? Because that's the real question, right? Yep. And I still say unequivocally no, until we're at the point where we're pushing materials around at the molecular level. Because... That's the only way we're ever going to get to where we can build a steel injection mold or even an aluminum injection mold uh, with a 3D printer that will produce the resolution and surface finish that a traditionally built injection mold will. I mean, you guys have seen the photos that were that that are that show up in in SMCG of even the very best parts that we're able to produce. Uh, well, like my P40 seat is a great example, right? The parts that I, I've thrown that thing to another, uh, uh, like half a dozen people to print so far. The prints coming off of a frozen Sonic 4K are amazing. It's a $300 machine. It's amazing. But the prints coming off of a Form 3, which is a $3,500 machine, are more amazing er. <laughs> yeah. But even as amazing or as they are, still nothing like what you would get off of a diamond polished injection steel injection mold. And it just can't be because of the nature of the technology. Uh, no matter how thin the layers are, no matter how tight the resolution is, it doesn't matter if it's 4K or 8K or whatever, you're still approximating surfaces with little squares, so to speak. Yeah, I th- I think the way that I feel about it, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, does it augment and replace maybe photo etch in a lot of different places? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 
but are you going to print a fuselage out of it um, and replace your Tamiya Spitfire fuselage with it? I don't, I don't know because not only do you have resolution issues, but you have material stability issues. There's that. Yeah. A lot of people overlook that. I mean, polystyrene kits are a thing for a reason and that, and that's very fundamental. And that is the fact that polystyrene is a polymer material that responds to solvent glue. If it was not for that key characteristic, I don't think we'd have a scale model industry. I mean, not the way not the yeah. way we know it. Kind of like how, you know, if, if it were not for a couple of very specific atomic positions, we wouldn't have an airline industry because aluminum wouldn't exist. Yeah, You know, you're just that close and people kind of take for granted that the materials do exactly what we need them to do, but we're just kind of lucky in that respect. Thermosetting resins, as you guys know, because now you got to super glue them. They don't melt. It's, it's a whole different deal. So now it's not going to replace injection molding anytime soon, but what it does do is give all of us the freedom to create basically anything we want to any way we want to. So if you're unsatisfied with the photo etch version or the currently available cast resin version, well, make your own. I think it will. I think it's interesting. The point that you made about SMCG kind of being a little bit more open to it and embracing it. I think, you know, printing your own custom pieces and parts is maybe in a three dimensional way, the same as custom making a color to airbrush on your model. You know, again, that kind of comes back to the art question, right? Yeah, it's 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 a very similar thing. Again, you're you're taking your knowledge and your skills and using them in a specific way to produce a certain vision. You know, I wanted the seat in my little one thirty second scale P forty to be as realistic as possible because we like that. That produces an emotional response. Uh, and I just didn't feel like the avail- the other options that were available were were going to produce that response. So, made my own. It's a it's a fascinating technology, and like you said, it seems like the availability of benchtop machines is going to be such that I think a lot of us, if not all of us, at some point will have one. Yeah, the only thing that a lot of people don't really glimmer to is the printer does you no good if you don't have a database. And the only way to get the database is to either have somebody sell it to you or give it to you so that you have a file to print. And if the thing that you want exists already as a file that somebody made, uh, you know, then great. But if it doesn't, you have to create the database yourself. You know, some, some, as, as we sort of expose more of what it takes to do even simple designs using something like Fusion 360, some guys are realizing, okay, th- there's more to this than it would have first appeared. But if you're willing to get in there, I mean, it's it's unlimited. Yeah. Well, Will, a lot of our listeners are, you know, they're familiar with your modeling. They're familiar with your social media content. But maybe what many of a lot of our listeners may not know is something you kind of had alluded to earlier. And uh, that's that you've had a pretty serious obstacle to overcome in your life. In 2009, you had an accident that initially left you paralyzed from the neck down. And I was hoping maybe you could talk to us and maybe talk about the sacrifices that it took to get you from that accident to where you are today and what you're you know what you're able to create in light of what we've been talking about. Well, I, I have to make one correction there because I'm, a, I'm an Ayn Rand fan. Don't make any political assumptions based on that. But one of her core philosophies is that if you wanted to do it, it was not a sacrifice. And trust me when I say I wanted to recover from having a spinal cord injury. So none of the hardships that I went through, none of the effort, none of the pain, uh, none of that was a sacrifice that was just what had to be done for me to stand any chance of not being stuck in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Cause that's what, that, that's what I was faced with. I was fortunate to never get told that I would never walk again, but I'll always wonder if they didn't tell me that because there was, they thought it was true or because they thought I would shoot myself if, if they did. 
you know, it's been, uh, it's been a hard, it's been a hard thing. It's certainly not the life I would have chosen, but I have just attempted to carry it with perseverance and dignity, I, I suppose. Well, one of the things I've always admired about you is that it doesn't seem like in your life that when people tell you, you can't do something that you're, you readily accept that. <laughs> yeah. I've, <laughs> I've never really ever been very interested in that assessment <laughs> that, and that has nothing to do with me uh, having, you know, suffered a spinal cord injury. That's just my nature. I've learned that sometimes those folks are right. Uh, but I had to find out for myself. And what's, what's tremendous is you have the challenges that you have and, you know, you have difficulties, you know, with your hands that most of us take for granted but yet you make beautiful, miniature, tiny little things in spite of those difficulties. And more than the work that you produce, to me, that's, that's, that's almost something that I admire you more for than maybe, you know, your creativity, but the way that you're executing that creativity with those challenges. Well, I, th I thank you. I appreciate that on all counts. I appreciate you saying nice things about my work, uh, for sure. That feels good because I do work hard at it. And, and the other thing is, is important too, because I really try hard not to allow my physical condition to be my identity. You know, sometimes it is, and that can't be helped, but I just really try to try to do the best I can at what I do. And, and, and like I said, just carry it with some level of, of dignity and, and perseverance. So I appreciate that. I really do. How do you think your perspective is different as it relates to modeling, but maybe, maybe even in the bigger picture as it relates to life? How is your perspective different than it was prior to your injury? <laughs> Whew. I don't think we have two more hours for this podcast, do we? <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, I don't. I don't know. I mean, it's a really good question. It really is. I mean, as far as as far as modeling goes, I don't know that my injury has affected my perspective at all. I think I approach the model making thing the same way I approach pretty much everything I do. I, I'm just I'm just a little crazy. I just I'm obsessive. I, I uh, you know, I, I, I wake up at four o'clock in the morning trying to figure out how I'm going to thread that cable th through, you know, the firewall of the model airplane I'm working on and make it connect to the right spot on the engine. Like, I can't help that. It just happens. I'm just kind of along for the ride that my brain takes me on. So I don't know that the injury really affected that. It gave me more time. <laughs> to pursue it, you know, I, cause I, I built models when I was a kid, like a lot of us and I left it behind for girls and beer and motorcycles, like a lot of us did. And I didn't come back to it until after my injury, uh, because my occupational therapist kept making me, you know, put a dozen marbles in a cup and repeat every day. And I was like, come on, I understand why you have to do those things. But I told her one day that I thought I should buy a model airplane kit because that would be really good for my fine motor skills. <laughs> she was kind of like, yeah, right. Uh, you, 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 go, you go champ, get on with your bad self. So I did. And uh, that first model airplane took me three years of, of off and on work. So the persistence, the, the, the desire to, to, to pursue it. That's all always been there, but I don't know that I would have ever come back to scale modeling had it not been for the injury. I mean, I would occasionally, if I was in a bookstore, I'd pick up a copy of a model airplane magazine and flip through it and think, wow, that'd be pretty cool to do that again. But I don't know that I ever would have. So I guess maybe you could say that the injury in a way is responsible for me being here in the first place you know, don't mistake that for being grateful because I would trade everything that I've gained through scale modeling for not having had to go through the injury. Yeah, of course. But it's where I am and I, and I feel like I've made the best of it. As far as life in general goes, you know, man, that's a, that's a way bigger question. Uh, there's parts of me that 
are the same as they always were. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm grateful for those because some of those are what got me through it. I've always been a bit hard headed and refuse and, 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 and tenacious. My friends say I'm the most tenacious person they've ever met. And if that were not true, I don't know that I would be walking. I don't know yeah. that I would be able to sit through the pain sometimes of, of threading that cable through the firewall of the model airplane. Cause there are times when it just, it just hurts, man. So, you know, some of that's always been there. I think that it has made me maybe a little more tuned in to the things that people are going through in life. Uh, you know, cause you can't spend three months in a hospital full of people who have had spinal cord injuries and traumatic brain injuries and leave that place the same as you went in unless you just don't have any humanity. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit on the perspective side, uh, but it also has made me even less sympathetic than I ever was because I am certainly not the worst off of people. And I saw folks who were in worse shape than me uh, trying a lot harder. And so I don't have a lot of room for people's excuses, honestly. Yeah, that's, co- that's completely understandable. Uh, you know, I mean, look, there's always those kind of things that are going to make us not want to get out of bed on any given day, but it's a choice. I just feel like that we, we, all, we all have to decide. We all have to decide how much of life we want to live. And uh, Well, anyway, I, I, the, see, I'm going to start rambling. You got me to do it. <laughs> I'm annoying myself and probably everybody else. So No, no, not at all. Well, let me ask you one last question to kind of wrap this up. If there is a listener out there who is interested in hobbies, because heaven knows, uh, God bless them if they've come here by mistake. Um, to listen to this podcast. <laughs> but if there's somebody out there who has a physical or mental challenge ahead of them, what would you say to them as far as um, taking that dive into hobbies and and seeing what they can do? What, what would you say based on your experience? I would say do it. I would say absolutely do it and be objective about what your challenges are and do whatever you have to do to work around those. I mean, the, if you guys can watch me honestly on a 24 seven basis and see the ridiculous things that I sometimes have to do just to get things done, this would make more sense and you'd probably get a few laughs, but I, I would just say you have to, I mean, a, 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 you know, a, a spinal cord injury in particular will definitely will alter the way you think about getting things done. I mean, the things you took for granted, that's obvious. You're not going to get those things done in the same way, but just, just don't take, don't let your physical disability or whatever it is be the only answer. When you ask yourself, should I do this? Should I try this? Because chances are, if you're thinking about it in the, in the same terms that you did when you were uh, without a disability, it'll stop you. But if you think about it in the context of, okay, I do have a disability. What are my weaknesses? What can I do? And how can I work my way around this problem? That you may find a way to, to something that you didn't think you could achieve. I mean, that's basically my whole journey into scale modeling from that first one that I built that took me three years. I just, I just kept inventing ways to get stuff done. That's tremendous. Well, thank you so much, Will. Yeah. Appreciate your, your candor and allowing us to get into kind of some of your, uh, your personal uh, struggles here, but also to talk about all of your talents and interests and all the things that you do. It's obvious that uh, you're not bored and uh, sitting around waiting for, uh, no. you, you know, the next TV episode to drop. You're a hardworking guy and uh, just a tremendous uh, insight today. So thank you so much. 
Well, th- look, thank you guys for for having me on. I mean, it's flattering. I I appreciate the opportunity to speak some of my own truth, and I'm stoked that there are people who find value in it. I, uh, you know, I, I'm just glad you guys are doing what you're doing. You, you know, your thing of having interesting people on, uh, not necessarily me, but uh, I think is really cool. And I and I wish you guys all the best. And I and I hope that you're able to keep this thing going because the community needs it. Well, thank you so much. You know, you and I have talked privately about sort of the madness of having a a podcast about a visual medium, but. You know, we've really enjoyed it and, and conversations like this have made it just really tremendously rewarding. Anyway, thanks again for coming on and uh, love to have you back sometime. This has been a lot of fun. All right. Thank you. All right. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Will. Uh, Fantastic guy uh, and a great modeler. Uh, He's got so much to offer all of us, so we hope you you got a lot out of that interview. This episode, just a reminder, is brought to you by our good friend Anthony Goodman and Goodman Models. Um, You need to check out his super sanding blocks. They are awesome. I finally got my set. I've been using it. They are better than I had hoped for. So, Anthony, take it away. Hey, this is Anthony from Goodman Models. You are listening to the Plastic Posse Podcast. This is the podcast for miniatures, Star Wars, science fiction models, and everything in between. And while you're listening in, working on your models, pick up a set of super sanding blocks, tools that will help you sand with precision. Check them out at GoodmanModels.com and keep the glue to your sprue. Thanks, Anthony. We'd like to remind you guys to listen to the other scale modeling podcasts out there. We have James and Malcolm at uh, Just Making Conversation, Dave, Edie, and Julian uh, from On the Bench, Mike and Dave from Plastic Model Mojo, and Stuart and Friends up north of the Scale Model Podcast. These are all great podcasts. They've done nothing but help us out. Give them a listen and enjoy thanks tj and we'd also like to remind you if you're enjoying the podcast please take a minute and wherever that you are getting our podcast from give us a rating especially if you can give us a five-star rating that'll help other scale modelers or people that are interested in scale modeling find the podcast appreciate you taking the time to do that for us thanks a lot all right be sure to check out our next episode where we have enrique from the race for terra youtube channel He's a really talented modeler. He's got a really neat channel, and I think it'll be a good interview. So make sure you check that out. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Well, you guys have a happy holidays. Have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I hope you guys are safe. Uh, To all you listeners out there, uh, whatever you celebrate, have a happy holidays. Stay warm and safe. We'll be back in the new year with uh, more episodes and uh, more interviews and more conversations. And probably a few uh, maybe New Year's resolutions as well. You guys take care. We'll talk in a couple of weeks and uh, see you later. Have a good one. And a happy new year. (laughs) (laughs) Operatic, isn't it? (laughs) 